Welcome to the Run for God Run Club, where you will find God in a runner's space. Welcome to the Run for God Run Club. This is your one stop each week to be motivated and inspired to get off the couch and onto the running trail where you can, in turn, inspire others to do the same. Let's learn, laugh, and leap into running together, giving God the glory for what we are able to do in His name. Amen. I am your running host, Dean Thompson. Joining me once again on this, well, it's an Olympic edition of the Run for God Club Run Club podcast. It's Run for God founder Mitchell Hollis. How you doing, Dean? <laughs> Good. I just can't talk this morning. You know, it's very rare that we come in here. We hardly didn't say anything to each other. We just come in here and got right to it. So how have you been? Good. What about you? I've been good. You were yeah. in Ames, Iowa this past weekend. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And you've been out of town as well. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I said, I said just a little while ago, I'll be glad when we get back to normal. Uh, yeah. No and, uh, kidding. So it's been busy. Been yep. good though. Have you been watching some of the Olympics? It's a lot of fun. I have. Yeah. Um, hmm. Not as much as I would like, but uh, yeah. I I don't know if anybody saw my post. If you're friends with me on Facebook, you probably saw my post. The it was one of the first few nights of the Olympics. I was watching the swimming. I love watching the swimming. And whistling. somebody in the crowd was whistling, and it was so annoying. It was. It was like I could. You could tell it was somebody trying to give cadence. Probably. Well, I think that, but it was for I, every single swim meet, and so for every event, and it went on and on and on. And I finally had to change the channel. And you know there there aren't any spectators there. Well, the teams so are there. The teams are there. So this was somebody on one of the teams. Yeah, that's doing this. And it was so so. Some guy was being talked about all over the world <laughs> last week. I feel like I see that at every swim meet, though. But this was loud. It I mean, was this loud. was this was near the microphone yeah. or near the you know camera mics <laughs> or something. But it was man, it was terrible. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll talk more about the Olympics here in a few minutes, but uh, pondering the question, what do we do when God seems to be prompting us to do something and our mind says no? That's never happened to you, has it? all the time. <laughs> all the time. And in Dean's thoughts this week, we're going to talk about how expectations can shape what we do. Awesome. Well, before we get to the story, we're going to talk about this week's sponsor, um, this is a familiar name. It's uh, State Farm with Brandon Combs. Uh, you know, when you want to make the right decision, it feels good. Like picking the perfect accent rug or choosing a good night's sleep over an all-night crime show binge. It feels really good to make the right insurance decision, too. That's why State Farm agent Brandon Combs is right here in Dalton, Georgia, uh, to help you select your right protection at the right price. Brandon will make sure you understand your State Farm, what your State Farm coverage is, so that you'll know what to expect if the unexpected happens with State Farm agent Brandon Combs. It's easy to make the right choice. Just call him. When you want a real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. So, Brandon, thank you for your support. Absolutely. And and by the way, if you have a business, if you're listening to this, and maybe you have a business out there, and you want to support Run for God um, and, and allow us to highlight your business, uh, reach out to Lane, Lane Hollis, at runlanehollis at gmail.com, and he'll get you all the information. Yeah, yeah. State Farm. I have dealt with State Farm since I was old enough to drive. Really? So... Great company. What, 40 years now. Great so, company. Yeah. We have a Facebook post from this week, and it comes from Valerie Johnson. It says this, I usually only post my workouts in Strava, but I'm just so thrilled with our progress on this Couch to Marathon journey. Love you, Run family. I did my time trial today. I started to ugly cry during the time trial because I was just so overcome with gratefulness on how far we have all come on this Couch to Marathon journey. God is so good. Peace. For every car that passes me, I give the peace symbol. This is my greeting and prayer that the peace be with them. Every time the breathing is hard, I'm pushing really hard. I start to think I cannot do it. Then I remember from Dean Thompson, relax. My shoulders drop, and I hear the words, My peace I give to thee. My breathing steadies. My steps again have purpose. Shalom, knowing that no matter what, God is, and I trust him. I love how much she can motivate me to run. Daisy, my dog, is my backup why. Look at that. 
I was mostly in zone five, proof that I was pushing. I was dreading this run. I was a little anxious about the possibility of injury, so I made sure to warm up well and stretch well in foam roll before the run and warmed up a little bit more. LOL. I even started running a little slow because I'm concerned about my knees, quads, and hamstrings. But God. <laughs> That's a good good story from Valerie. And just the idea, that the, the realization of kind of leaning on God and and relaxing because yeah. he's got it well and i love i love to go on the run club group and just read the comments and see because people are making some pretty big breakthroughs right about now yeah you know, we, we've we've dipped our toe into the half marathon training which is a whole different ball game mm -hmm. and people were coming in with doubts fears not sure they could do it and people like valerie are I mean, I, I love the ugly, ugly cry comment. Yeah, I do too. Um, you know, we've seen those personally before. Yeah, and it's just incredible to see people who are doing things. You know, it's kind of the theme of this week's podcast: doing the things that you didn't think you could do. Yeah, and uh, so congratulations to Valerie and everybody else out there who's who's really knocking this training out of the park. It's going to be fun. You know, Disney registration was yesterday, and um, we've got a lot of run club members yeah, we who we're going to be meeting in in january in orlando and that's going to be a, a ton of fun so you know we had some attrition um but that's to be expected but right. we've got a lot of people who have who've signed on the dotted line they've paid their money and it's game on now yeah yeah i'm so excited it's real now yeah huh? yeah sure is yeah, this, this thing with Valerie, she, it's so easy to get discouraged when we don't feel great. But one of the things I wanted to point out, about, point out about what she did was she did something. She didn't just rely on God. She did something, mm -hmm. right? She was very intentional about the way that she uh, she said, okay, I'm going to remind myself to relax. I'm going to remind myself with through Scripture that God is here and he's with me. And um, sometimes uh, it, it takes a little bit of action on our part. Uh, to see that great result that, that we're all looking for. Instead of what our normal reaction is, we get worried and we get uptight and we get tense, and then that makes things worse. Mm -hmm. She did the very opposite of that, mm -hmm. and it made things better. And uh, relaxing, it's just so important, right? Yeah. So did you watch the Olympic triathlon I sure all? did. Did you I watch sure. both of them, the men's and the women's? Yeah. Yeah. They were yeah for the um, men's, that was on Sunday night, and we actually had a uh, an event at church so uh, our whole family went on um electronic blackout i took everybody's phones and i put them in the car and nobody was allowed to touch their phones because you know how it is yeah with all the things we follow on social media as soon as you pull up instagram you're gonna boom you're gonna see who won so yeah. we, went on, we went on a blackout <laughs> and uh we got to the it was a cookout at our church property and uh, a lady, first thing she came up to me, did you see the start of the triathlon? And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> don't, don't tell me anything else. She said, well, it's never happened before. <laughs> and so from that point on, I was like miserable at this church cookout because uh, I was just couldn't no. wait to get home and figure out what happened. But uh, Well, what happened at the start? I didn't see the start. So on the men's side, um, I don't really know how it happened, but – Everybody was lined up, but there was a boat um, down right up against the starting dock, and uh, the starter started them. No. And so half of the field jumped, dove in, and started swimming, and half of the field is standing on the dock pointing at the boat saying, we, we can't go. And then usually on a false start in triathlon, they'll blow the horn three times. So in, when you're swimming, you can hear it. Right. So if they blow it three times, that means stop and come back. Well, they didn't do that. Wow. So they sent these little boats out, and by the time they got to the – and this was the – all the contenders were on, on this side of the dock that jumped in. And so by the time the boats got out there to get them back, they had probably already swam 200 meters. Wow. I mean – and, you know, a swim start is the hardest part of the swim. Yeah. It's when yeah. you exert the most energy. Yeah. So they called them all back, and, you know, none of the contenders were on the podium. Wow. So, you know, is that the reason? I would argue it's it's not the reason, but you know 
that that's going to be made part of the reason. Yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. But a guy named Christian Blumenfeld, man, won the men's race, and he is my kind of athlete. You yeah. know, we talk about Formula One and diesel engines. This guy's a diesel engine. Yep. He is hardcore. Does the crazy insane workouts to test himself all the kind of workouts that we used to yeah put on our kids to see if we could break them well he does those to himself yep you know he swims 21 miles a week bikes over 200 and is running 70 plus miles a week but he's an ironman athlete as well and uh i didn't know that yeah yeah i think he holds one of the top 70.3 times in the world wow and uh but yeah, I just loved his intensity. I, I mean, you probably saw the end of oh, it. Where yeah. He he doesn't look like he doesn't have the build of your typical slender, you know, triathlete. Of that group in the front, you had six or eight guys right there in the front going right. into that last lap. He looked the least like a runner, right? And he just just blew him away. Yeah, in that last lap. Yeah, it was crazy. It was uh, it was a lot of fun to watch, yes, and then it was. obviously Flora Duffy in the in the women's race. Yeah, man, she just that girl can run. She just kept opening the gap. Yeah, she just went out hard and never let up. Yeah, it reminded me of a of a younger triathlete we know. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just just goes out and just hammers. Yeah, it was it was impressive for yeah. sure. For sure, it was pretty cool. The uh, the American that was he finished higher than in the guys race finished higher than any Americans ever finished before. Sure. Um, that was pretty cool. I don't know that anybody really expected him to finish that high. Um, no, and, and and to think that you know he he's a cancer comeback. Yeah, um, it, I, I'm I'm drawing a blank here. All of a sudden, Kevin is it Kevin Kevin McDowell. Mc, yeah, um, yeah. I mean he he. He over fought and overcome cancer just I think it was in two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. Yeah. Uh so just an incredible comeback story of, you know Neat story. So, Neat yeah. story. Yeah, you know, Flora Duffy has the distinction now of being the gold medal winner from the smallest country ever to win a gold medal. Yeah. I think that's well, that country's cool. only ever had one medal, period. Yeah, yeah. And uh, from Bermuda. Yep. But yeah, it's, it's funny that she's from Bermuda, but she doesn't live in Bermuda. She splits her time between South Africa and uh, Boulder. Boulder, Colorado. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so she doesn't even live there. Well, but, you uh, see a lot of that. Yeah. A lot of these athletes that tr- that are from other countries are training in the United States. Sure. So uh, yeah, they said Bermuda is one fifth the size of Tucson. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's, population sixty thousand. I pulled it up. That's crazy. I looked at it. I mean, that's half the size of our our little town here. That's unbelievable. Uh, but then you know, I, I got you, you watch the different training philosophies of some of these athletes, and we we kind of we follow some of this. But like, so Flora Duffy, she she tries to stay at altitude and and is traveling all these places. But then you have somebody like Katie Zafaris. Who is the bronze? She lives and trains in North Carolina. Yeah, you know she's mm-hmm. married there. So, you know, Lane and I were having this conversation the other night. You know how is it necessary to go and train at all these places, or is it is it all up here? You know, I understand there's there's some benefit to altitude training, but. Is it always necessary? I wonder how much of the altitude training is not the actual conditioning and the acclimatization of your lungs and, and how your body works as it is. You just have more to overcome when in training. Sure. Because training's harder. It's just harder when right. you're when you're at altitude. And maybe that has more to do with it than anything. Why why often those athletes do well? I I don't know. But Or is it that or is a lot of the gains because you're at altitude, you think you're getting faster, therefore you get faster. Yeah. Lane had a we, we had we had a very long debate the other night. Not debate, just he, he brought up the point is it worth the cost to buy the placebo effect? <laughs> This is only that's, a lane thought. Yeah, that's a 
That's an interesting thought. But you know, we we talked about when he was when he was young. You know his his bike really got to the point where it's holding him back. The physical bike that he was riding, and and there was a point where we bought him a nicer bike um, because a bike does make you faster. But there was a point where we bought him carbon wheels, and for Lane, at that distance and at that age, carbon wheels did almost zero. Yeah. For him, I mean, his races were 10k on the bike, and at speeds of 25 miles an hour or less, science shows that carbon wheels do very little. But when we bought those wheels for Lane, it's like he thought that he was going to be way faster, and therefore he was. He was, yeah. He became faster. So what he was saying, you know, so many people will dismiss, well, you really don't need those wheels because they're not actually going to make you faster. And his argument is, well, if I think they're going to make me faster, then they're going to make me faster. So his his question was, is it worth it to buy the placebo effect? That's a pretty good question. And, I like uh, it. I guess it He's depends. Get, it, yeah. it depends how yeah. much you willing to. My only problem with the question and the whole premise of the question is this. You're going to say exactly what I said. You, is what you're saying then is I'm just. I'm too dumb to realize the truth, and so I'm willing to pay extra. Or you to, realize the truth, and you're paying it anyway. Yeah, well, yeah. If that's you realize worst. the truth, then the, is the placebo effect really there? Yeah, you can't really do it that way. You, yeah, it's uh, yeah. yeah. The question of whether or not it's worth the money if you get the placebo effect sure. is one thing, but if you know it's a placebo effect, then you it's it's a waste of money. So then you're just kidding yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that <laughs> was funny. that was kind of my response too. That's but, good stuff. But yeah, I mean, it was pretty thought. I mean, it went on for. Well over an hour, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and Holly and Lane are, Lane and are sitting in the room with us. <laughs> and, well, why uh, are they still arguing? <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good debate. Well, there were some other good things, too, that we've seen so far in the Olympics. You, did you see the 46-year-old gymnast? There is a gymnast. She's 46 years old. She competed in the Olympics the first time in 1992. That's unheard of. I know, and I just think it's so awesome that yeah. she's still there. And you could see all the young folks were kind of gathering around her, getting their picture taken with her, and because she's just a legend. Well, you know, I saw something on uh, how do you say her name, Simone Simone Biles, Biles, Biles yeah. um, where she's like twenty three now, and where she trains at, all her training partners make fun of her because of how old she is. Yeah. They're like 10 years younger than her. Right. And she's the old lady in yeah. the training group. But yeah. um, she, she did she pull out She pulled yesterday? out yesterday. And yeah. And, I don't uh, really know what that was all about, but I, I saw that she may be coming back. There's lots of speculation. She, they say that she's already pulled out of the all around. Really? And that, she, yeah. And we don't, by the time this comes out, everybody's we'll going to know. know what happened. But, yeah. uh, but right now, we're kind of up in a shock. I saw that headline. Yeah. Last but she night. was really having a hard time mentally with sticking landings and things. And, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it was, uh, that's sad to see somebody do that. But yeah. we've seen athlete after athlete go through a mental breakdown where they just, for whatever reason, as good as they are, they just can't get it. I remember Steve Sachs, a baseball player mm-hmm. back years ago, who was a second baseman who has the shortest throw to first base, and and suddenly he couldn't throw a ball to first base from second base. And mm-hmm. this happened. He threw error after error because he couldn't throw the ball from second base to first base. And uh, it took him a long time to get over it. And sometimes I just – it's amazing. The mental side of sports is, is really Oh, yeah, really for amazing. sure. We had a couple of firsts. We had our first gold medal in Taekwondo and foil fencing. I've never watched that before. I don't know what before. that is. Well, I watched it. It was fascinating. It was fun to watch. It really was fun to watch. Uh, and this girl who won the, the Taekwondo, she was so excited. She was jumping up. and it was. That's what I love to see. I love to see an Olympic athlete who just gets – some of them, you know, they win, and they're a little stoic about it, and it's like, this is great. And, you know, and then some of them, they just lose their mind. Yeah. And, they just go, and I love to see that. Yeah. And this girl lost her mind. Um, that, and then I saw I saw canoeing. I didn't know that was in there either. Well, I didn't know it either. I didn't know there was such a thing as canoeing. But I saw canoeing one day and kayaking the next day. And I'm still not sure what the difference is because they sure looked a lot alike. Really? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I'm assuming the boats are just a little bit different. And well, I'm not, canoeing's got an open hold on it. No, this one didn't. Really? No. Yep. Hmm. It looked. A I lot don't know. Like, it looked a lot like a kayak. So I don't know. Um, 
And then I had never seen three on three basketball before. And nice. I guess that's new to the Olympics. That's a pretty fast game. They have a 12 second shot clock. 12 <laughs> seconds. It's like, you know. They, Is the court the same size? They, they play half court. Oh, they play half court. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, but the ball has to come back outside the three point line before you can go back in. And so you got 12 seconds to get the ball out and then get it back in. I mean, it, it's boom, boom, boom. They're moving. Wow, it's, it was that yeah, was kind of exciting to watch. Uh, and I didn't did did you know mountain biking was an Olympic sport? I had no idea. <laughs> no, but it is. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I watched both of those. I saw somebody wipe out coming down a hill, which is something I would do if I was on a mountain oh, bike. Oh yeah. yeah, I've done it. Yeah. yeah, and these guys know what they're doing. Matter of fact, this guy was a guy who was a, a you know a consummate professional who was in the Tour de France a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Was racing on uh, apparently was racing on this. Uh, well, maybe he spends too much time on his road bike. Maybe that's why he read. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of road bikers train on mountain bikes. Yeah. You know, it's for the stability and all that. There's so much. Well, it's kind of like trail running. You know, you work mm-hmm. all those muscles that you don't normally work road running or road biking. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't know mountain bike. It was the, there's so many There's so many new sports, it seems like, Yeah. in the Olympics. Uh, well, there's some sports, you know, that are no longer there. So listen to this. From 1904 to 1920, there was a sport in the Olympics that, when I tell you what it is, you're going to be like, seriously? They had tug of war <laughs> in the Olympics from 1904 to 1920. That would be fun to watch, though. That would be fun to watch, yeah. I mean, because that's just brute strength. Yeah. That's kind of like the uh, what the strongest man competitions yeah. that you watch sometimes. Yeah. Um, that would be kind of fun to watch, but uh, yeah, that was interesting. Did they have a mud pit time. in the middle? I don't know. I don't know. So that would be even better. That would, yeah, it would be. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my favorite thing that I saw of the entire week was the the American Olympic swim team, and they were all gathered around in a circle, and somebody was just video. You could tell they're doing it on a, on a on a phone, <clears throat> so they were kind of off by themselves, and they were singing "God Bless America." Hmm. And with all the other stuff that we've seen, that made me want to cheer for the swimmers so much harder than I was any other sport. Yeah. Because um, they they get it. Yeah. They get what the Olympics is well, about. I think it's sad that, you know, they gave a statistic the other day, and you probably heard this, that the Olympics this year has the lowest viewership since like the 60s. Yeah. Or in 60 years or something like that, which I guess would be about the same time. Um, but that's so sad that you know because there is a lot of there's a lot going on surrounding the olympics that really has nothing to do with the olympics it's yeah. olympics has been used as a punching bag but it's so sad because when you get down to the athlete and the time i mean we've talked about this before most mm. of these athletes that you see on that tv at the olympics they've been doing this their whole life that's right and they've trained and trained and trained and the olympics still is the greatest sporting event there are because of the stories. Yeah. Because that people have given everything to get there, and it's a shame that, you know, certain powers to be has have turned it into, you know, whatever. You know, we can debate that all day long, but it's it's turned some parts of it to turn political, and that's that's sad. And people are too tuning out for that reason. Yeah. And it's a shame. It is because um, it's fun to watch. I mean, like I watched normal fencing the other night. I've never watched that in my life, but it was. It was cool. I mean, it was really fun to watch. Yeah. You know, they're very – how did they – I want to know how fencing judged back before they had these light up. That had to be be hard, right? Yeah, because you you would swear that they touched at the same exact time. Yeah. But, the you know, with the technology nowadays, you can tell who touched a millisecond before the other one. But back before then, you had to – you had judges standing on the side just watching. Yeah, so that would be tough. Yeah, I wouldn't want but, to be uh, that judge. No. <laughs> you know that judge had a had a hard time. Yeah, man, uh, I can't even judge. You know, uh, in baseball, when the umpire has to call somebody out at first, it's a really, you know, it's a really boom boom. And I can't tell. I just no tell how many times that you watch it back in slow motion and go, "Ooh, I would have got that wrong." Yeah, I'm not good at that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other observations that you saw? There's no track and field yet. It's coming, but uh, I can't wait for track and field. Yeah, I mean, I, the mixed team relay is this Friday night for triathlon. That'll be kind of cool to watch. Um, I won't be watching it because track and field will be on Friday. 
You can record it, Dean. Come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. We did have a trivia question from last week, and I think this was an easy one, though I think you said you didn't, didn't know the answer to this one. So. I didn't know. It makes sense now. The question is, what do the five Olympic rings signify? You know, you got five interlocking rings. They're all different colors. There's a blue, yellow, black, green, and red one on a white background. Um, and this symbol was originally created way back in 1913. So that symbol has been around for a very long time by a guy named Baron du Baron de Coburton. Coburton. Co- Coburton. I'm not even sure how you say his name. But this is the guy who – and what he intended the rings to represent was the, the five continents at that time. And so the five continents coming together now – after that, the colors, they said, also signified um, the colors of all the flags of all the nations that participated. Mm-hmm. And when you look at it and you look at the colors on the rings, you realize it, 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 you're hard-pressed to find a country that doesn't have one of those colors in their flag. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's what the – So Olympic Europe, singles. Africa, Asia, America. And Oceania. Oceania. Yeah. I don't, is, I don't know that I've ever seen that word. Yeah, I don't know why. Did I fail geography class or yeah, something? I don't think we called it Oceania when I was in uh, when I was in school either. What, what does it represent? Do you know? Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that means the Antarctica. Antarctica was always the the, the fifth continent. That's true. So uh, I'm assuming hmm. I'm assuming that along with Antarctica, they're putting in some other folk other things with it. But uh, yeah, hmm. so. Learn something new every day. I know it. <clears throat> so we talked about just uh, yesterday was the Disney registration. Hopefully everybody listening who's planning to run Disney is registered. I know that the half marathon filled up pretty quick. Lane signed up for the half marathon. Yeah. Uh, the 10K or the 5K filled up pretty quick. As of last night, the marathon was not full yet. It may be full this morning. Um and the 10K still had some spots. But we've got a few who are doing the Dopey Challenge. I don't know if you saw that on the Run Club group back All last right. night. Um, but that's always fun to, to watch those people after day four. Yeah. You talk about your four days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going we're gonna to put together something down there. We haven't figured out what yet. A uh, time we can all get together. We may meet up at a park or or do something. I, I Man, it's going to be – it'll be tough to try to get – all of us together at disney um that'll be a logistical nightmare plus it'd be expensive yeah for everybody yeah. to try to get in there so there's some pretty cool parks around there that we may uh but we'll be we'll be if you're listening you're going we'll be getting those details out to you here pretty shortly yeah it's gonna be fun As a mom, I want to make sure we choose a cereal that's not entirely derived from sugar. Their car seats have to be nationally CPS certified, and their first car has to have every possible safety feature known to man. I just want to do my best to make sure that they're safe. One thing I don't have to worry about is the content they hear on J-Radio. Not only do they love the music, but I know it's only going to be a positive message that I would approve of. Now, if I could just figure out how to get my youngest from sticking everything up his nose. Sign up at JRadio.com and download the new J-Radio app in your app store. All right. Have you listened to J-Radio yet? It is the world's greatest digital music platform. If you haven't listened to it, you need to give it a try and see what you think uh, because it's it's uplifting music. It's about time to do a new Run for God playlist. It is. We probably should do that soon. Yeah, maybe we put that out there in the next week or so and and get a new playlist up there. Yeah, that's a good idea. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. If you have questions, you can send those to dean at runforgod.com. I'll be glad to answer questions. I know I get I get them uh, daily, and sometimes uh, sometimes they're really good questions. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're questions that I'm like, hmm, I don't know if I know the answer to that one, so I've got to research it a little bit. So it's a good question if you stump Coach Dean. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine nine out of ten, I, I've got an answer for. Of course, what most folks do is that make sure if you're going to email me and give me tell me a problem you're having that you give me as much detail as possible because most of the time I have to ask questions um, because. You know, someone somebody says, my foot hurts. 
Um, what do I do? That's that's a hard thing to yeah. uh, <laughs> need a little context there. Yeah. Uh, all right, and we would love to hear your story. We're going to share somebody's story here in just a minute, but don't forget that you can submit your story at on the Run Club page. Mm-hmm. So go to the Run Club page, runforgodrunclub.com, and share your story with us so we can share your story right here. Sure. And then if you're available and can come and share it live, we can get you right here in the studio and you can share it live. So there you go. Sometimes we think we can be a little reluctant to do something that God seems to be telling us to do. Um, but it usually doesn't turn out well when we don't do what he's asking us to do, does it? We're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, Sylvia Miller's uh, story here. Um, she's from Lubbock, Texas, and her story is called "Being Obedient When Your Mind Says No, But Your Heart Says Yes." Now, just one thing to say: Sylvia is a Run for God coach instructor. Um, I, as I was reading the story, I noticed that it doesn't say that in there, so that kind of gives everybody a little bit of context. Yeah. That she's a Run for God coach, um, so I give you a little context. Good, good context, yeah. And this is what it says. I love running, and I love Jesus, but I don't like to teach. My heart was saying, go for it, but my mind was saying, no, you can't do this. I love helping others, and the burden on my heart was so heavy that I finally gave in to the call. I knew that once I committed, God would lead my steps. I had the fear of failing every week when it came time for for the study, but God always showed up and gave me just the right words to say. There were days when I felt I just could not do it. Just like in running, you have good days and bad days. I learned to keep my eyes on Jesus instead of what I could or could not do. I learned to focus on the things around me, such as the beauty that God created. I'm not sure where God will lead me from here as far as the study, but I know the study made a difference in the spiritual walk of my team. They are more confident about themselves in Christ and also knowing they made an attempt to be active and healthy. Someday, we will all hear our Savior say, Well done, thy good and faithful servants. Obedience is what it's all about. When God leads, He provides. How many times do we hear this same story? Well, a lot. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't help but the way she phrased this, I couldn't help but think of the song Two Out of Three Ain't Bad <laughs> from Meatloaf back from years ago. <laughs> yeah, I saw you know? your notes there, but I've never heard of that. <laughs> she's she's talking about – By she, who? She, meatloaf. You never heard of Meatloaf? Never heard of Meatloaf. Oh, my gosh. Is that a band? Yeah. Well, he's a guy. His name is, is actual – Given his given name is something else, but he goes by the name. What Meat else Loaf. does he say? Wait a minute, maybe I have heard that. Two out of three ain't bad. Is his fa- is his most famous song. He is sang Paradise by the Dashboard Light. And, nothing uh, compares to you. No, no, who's that? That's Sinead O'Connor. That's. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm and, way and off. Prince. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, she's talking about. I don't know that I know who Meatloaf is. She, she she loves Jesus and she loves running, but she doesn't like teaching, and that's kind of the two out of three kind of thing but god wanted all three in this case meatloaf <laughs> i can't believe you don't know who meatloaf is my goodness um we won't talk about the names of his albums or anything <laughs> not, yeah he's not uh but yeah i mean how many times does this happen you know god gives us <clears throat> passions and we want to do our passions yeah but many times he'll say, well, take your passion and do this. And many times that this is outside our comfort zone. Yeah. And that's where the magic with being in the center of God's will happens. Yeah. Is when we, we're taking the things that we're passionate about and we're using it to do things that we're uncomfortable with. Yeah. And when God is directing those steps, it's incredible what can happen. Yeah. But we have to be willing to step outside our comfort zone and answer that call because that is where, you know, many times he'll put things on us that we don't think we can do simply for the fact that he knows we can't take the credit for it. Mm-hmm. And we have to give all the credit to him. And it's a, it's a really cool place to be. And more times than not, that is exactly where Run for God coaches fall. Yeah. They love running. They, they love being active in their church. But we hear it all the time. Oh, I don't know if I can teach. That's exactly what I said. Yeah, you know when I felt God laying this on my heart, and the, I mean, matter of fact, the answer was no. 
it wasn't i'll think about it it was no yeah um but god's pretty persistent yeah yeah he'll he'll get you there for sure acts 20 19 through 24 says this serving the lord with all humility with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly and from the from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that the chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Hmm. You know... Paul Paul could have been very cocky about the things that he accomplished. Mm-hmm. He planted all these churches. Mm-hmm. He you know so many people were brought to the foot of the cross because of the things that Paul did. And he could have been really really pompous about what he was doing there. But he wasn't. He did all this stuff in humility. There's you know the stories about him living with very little Mm -hmm. um and just getting by and just getting by on on what people just kind of gave him um obviously or or it it was clear that paul wanted to serve with humility um and and i think in today's world we lose the idea of what humility is because i think in today's world we often look at somebody who I, i i don't know how to say this but it, it, I call it virtue signaling. They say something because they know it'll sound good, mm-hmm. but in their heart, that's not really what they're, they're they're just saying things. And I think Paul was so it was so in his heart to be um, to have humility and to show that it was all God. It had nothing to do with him. That he often talked about how he was um, he was such a bad person because of his history mm-hmm. that I don't even deserve I don't deserve any recognition for anything that's going on because it's all about God. Well, and we've talked about this before that the older he got and the later in his ministry that he got, mm-hmm. the more he referred to himself as even a worse sinner. Yeah. You know, he early in his ministry it was I'm the sinner and by the end of his ministry it's I'm the chief of all sinners. Um I don't I don't think you can you can't arrogantly how do I need to word this? You can't arrogantly follow Christ. That that can't happen. You're right. Um, because if you're arrogant, it's all about you, and it's not about Christ. Therefore, you're not following Christ. You may be a child of God, but to actively follow Christ takes a level of um, – it, it has to have humility. You know, Paul, I think he understood – the older he got that following Christ is not easy and it's going to come with a lot of challenges and if it doesn't come with the challenges the chances are you're not doing it right um, mm. you know I think Paul's life is a great reminder that it should be hard to follow Christ I mean look at all the statements that Jesus made in his ministry you know let the dead bury their own dead you know, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Um, I think that people will hate us for sharing Jesus. And that in of itself is a humbling thought. It is. Um, You can't, there's nothing arrogant about that statement. You can't make that statement and have arrogance because people will hate us. The cross is heavy. Um, And the name of Jesus is offensive to many people. And we should have joy in those things and that's that's so counter culture today um you know today it's it's all about not offending someone or not hurting someone's feelings but paul didn't care about that yeah paul cared about where were they going to spend eternity and 
I don't mind if I offend you or hurt your feelings. If there's a chance, I'm going to win you to Christ. But that's in some circles that's not allowed today, and that I, I think that's why Paul's story is so out front in the New Testament because he, his ministry is our ministry. And we should follow in his footsteps. And Paul took it a step further by by going right into the lion's den regularly. You yeah. know, Paul Paul didn't just want to share Christ; he wanted to go to the places where it would have the biggest impact. Sure. In those places where Jesus was needed more than any other place, where he, basically Jesus was absent. Right. You know, we we worry about sharing with people in places where it's it's not gonna be too bad you know yeah you may get rejected somebody may even say something to you not the same not the same as what paul went through paul knew he could be killed for what he was doing and uh well he even pretty much said it i mean he yeah. he said i don't know what lays ahead of me yeah but i'm going anyway yep that's that's boldness that's yeah. boldness in its most pure form right yep. there absolutely yep and so Back to the story, you know, teaching a run for God class is is super super hard for some people. Mm-hmm. You know, for for me, teaching a class is fun. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it. I I love doing that. For a lot of people, that's like singing in public for me. You won't ever catch me singing in public. That scares me to death. Yeah, that, that whole idea. I'll talk all day long. I ain't singing. Everybody's glad, I think. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but for some people, it's hard, and, uh, and we we do hear that all the time. That people have overcome that, the, the anxiety and, and all. And of course, what's great about it, right back to what we were talking about, is for a lot of people, with Christ is the only way they can overcome that fear. Yeah, and I think another fear, and this is kind of the one of the unspoken fears. I don't think we hear this much because. And I get it. You just you don't want to hear yourself say it out loud, but it's it's the fear of, you know, in some parts of the countries, we've heard from some of our instructors that say, you know, they get looked down on. You know, we, we don't experience that here. We wear a Run for God shirt, and everybody's like, yeah, I love your shirt. And if, you know, somebody don't like it, chances are they don't say it. But in certain parts of the country, I know we've got had some instructors in California. Yeah. And they have told us that, you know, they'll get yelled at, shouted at, you know, ridiculed just for wearing those shirts. And so th- there's a little bit of intimidation because they're putting their faith out there. Yeah. Which is what we're, we're called to do. And I, right. and I understand that fear. But we should be bold all the much more mm-hmm. if that's the case because – Man, those are those are the huge opportunities. That's right. Uh, like to, we've talked about before, right? Yeah. Those those, are the, those are the people that are under the strongest conviction, and um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the unspoken fears that that some of our instructors have around the country. Yep. But what leads people to share anyway, and, and teach a class anyway, is the same thing. It's very similar to what Paul Paul had this overwhelming desire. Who want to tell people about Jesus? Right. And when you teach a Run for God class, it's probably because you have this desire to help other people, and and you want to do it in a way that is something that you enjoy doing. Right. And uh, so very similar motivations. Philippians three twelve through fourteen. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hmm. That's... (laughs) Unrelenting quest to be more like Jesus is what was my my, my thought, was that that whole idea that no matter what, we're going to keep pressing forward. Just like we do in a race, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny the parallels. Yeah. Second Timothy four seven. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Um, we've talked about this verse a few times lately. I don't know why this one's suddenly coming up so often. Mm-hmm. It seems like it is though. Funny how that happens. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but it's back to that humility and that that whole new definition. Um, Paul was so confident 
in what he knew. But he wasn't arrogant about it. Right. He was just confident about it. And be, because he knew that everything that he said was grounded 100% in truth and he could back every bit of it up right. with evidence. Um, so you look at because because I look at this statement. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. It sounds arrogant. If that's all you heard, was that and people will twist it that way. They will, but it it certainly wasn't. No, uh, and I, I think you've got to look at it. What do you think the difference is between saying something in a way that's cocky and confident? What's well, number the difference number one that? with this statement, Paul said this on his deathbed. Yeah. I mean, he was about to die. Right. Um, until that point, let's put it in running terms. Up until that point, he simply trained. He trained and he trained and he trained. Um, you know, if putting it in running terms, if Paul would have made the comment, I'm going to run off and leave everyone in today's race. I'm, you know, these followers of Jesus can just eat my dust. Well, that would have been cocky. Yeah. But what Paul said on his deathbed is just like the amazing athletes that I love to see when somebody sticks a microphone in front of them right before, you know, the starting gun goes off and they say, I put in the time, my training is over, and I've done everything I need to do. Well, when we hear that, we don't see that as cocky. Yeah. I mean, we see that as confident. Yeah. You can see it. Yeah, on them, you know. I, but there's some people who would say, "Yeah, I'm going to blow everybody away. This race ain't even going to be a race." That's cocky. Well, and I think some of this is an interpretation thing too. And I, a really good example happened last night. We, I was going to a Bible study last night, and as everybody else was there, I was, I was a few minutes late. I walked, I walked up, and everybody that was there, as I walked up, they clapped for me, and they were talking about winning a national championship. And it was very. It was a nice thing to do. And one of them asked me a strange question. He said, "Are you proud of yourself?" Mm. And I thought about it for a second because I hadn't thought about it. And I thought, "Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am proud. There's nothing wrong with being proud." Yeah. Um, but it, it really, it really took me back for a second. Um, but that was that was uh, that in today's world. A lot of times, some people would look at that as, "Well, that sounds cocky." I didn't mean it in a cocky way. You know, I, was, I, I really feel good about what I was able to accomplish. I worked hard for that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I th- a lot of times it depends on your heart when you say it, you know? Well, I th- yeah, I think it's all about your heart. Yeah, and I think it gets misinterpreted often. Right. And that's why it's so important to know people, to know the person making the statement. Because two people can make the same exact statement and one be cocky. And one be confident and humble. Yeah, um, you got to know the heart of the person, and I think that's you know, that's why it's so dangerous in the world we live in. We take the the clips from this and that, and there's no context. You have to have context yeah. behind these type of statements. And um, but there's nothing wrong with being confident in sport and our walk with Christ. Um, that's that's what. That's what carries us through training. That's what keeps us in the Word every day is because we're confident in what God's Word says. Therefore, we can be confident in our walk with Him. Yeah, it's true. Question, what is God calling you to do? And I I, I guess I would say God's got something for all of us. And there's some people, I hear this all the time, people tell me, uh, well, God didn't really give me a talent. Mm. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. It says in the Bible, it tells us that we've all got Mm -hmm. spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so everybody has a talent that they can use. Um, And the trick is, is it harder to find for some people? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's there. And it doesn't have to be something earth-shattering, right? It doesn't – I've brought up before the lady at, at our church who used to send newspaper clippings and she would send um, just little notes, just a handwritten note on a piece of notebook paper with a penny folded up inside of it and send it through the mail and say, you know, I'm just thinking about you today. 
I love you and, 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 and everything you stand for, whatever. She would, but she would send these things. That was a big deal. Mm-hmm. I didn't take any – that was her talent mm-hmm. was to care about people. Encouragement. And, and encouragement. And so maybe, maybe that's yours. If you're out there and you're going, I don't have a talent, there's something out there. So let me throw this out there. <clears throat> Because we've kind of had this theme coming through the podcast this morning, so I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. You know, chances are, if if you're listening to this podcast, you're a runner of some sort. Mm-hmm. You may be a really fast runner. You may be a really slow runner. You may be a walker. It doesn't matter. This fall, we're going to start promoting the Couch to Marathon 2022 Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're doing this again. We've had a lot of people watching us, a lot of people who tried it, didn't quite make it. I know they're going to start over again. But we're going to start challenging you, everybody listening to this, everybody that's ever been a part of Run for God, we're going to ask you to do something this January. We're going to ask you to facilitate, coach, instruct, whatever you want to call it, a class in your community for the Couch to Marathon Challenge. Now, Dean and I are going to do a lot of the heavy lifting. We're, 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 going to be, we're going to be doing this week after week. We're going to be leading the classes. So really all you've got to do is go power up the computer and set up a monitor for everybody to look at. But we want you to step outside your comfort zone and facilitate one of these. You know, I, I said last week, I think I gave the number – away a few weeks ago last week or some other time i I said i don't know that we're giving the number out yet Ten thousand. Ten thousand is the number of people that we want starting this journey with us in january you and i can't do that alone that's right but you helping us you listening helping us we could blow that number out of the water yep so i want you to start praying about it right now thinking about it praying maybe god is just thumping your heart right now and you've already got the answer yeah i need to do that we're gonna we're gonna make it easy for you but go ahead and start thinking about that right now thinking about a game plan in your head we're going to give you lots of instruction and materials and all the stuff to to help you get the word out in your community um but run for god has been taught in over 5500 communities around the world in the past 11 years what kind of statement can we make if we all start this journey together this January? Some of us will be outside our comfort zone. Some of us will be well inside our comfort zone. But think about the power of all these groups running, training together. Maybe we meet up a couple of times next year for some of the races. Maybe, you know, if, if you're part of Run Club, you get and run at the mill for free. You know, we've, we've got a marathon picked for the graduation that we're not giving the name of just yet great location what kind of impact can we make if we're all doing this at the same time with the same training with the same instruction and graduating at the same race could be huge awesome could be so if you're listening to this you can do this and we're asking you to help us do this yeah absolutely um so just kind of be – I'm putting that out there right now for you just to think about. There's nothing to do right now other than be thinking about it, praying about it, talking to your family about it, maybe bouncing it around you know, your community to some people who might help you. Um, but it will be instructing in a very different way than our instructors in the past have done it. It's basically going to be facilitating. We're making it much easier for you is what I'm saying. Yeah. So be thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Here's another question. Are you filling your soul with things of God or things of this world? <laughs> uh, it, 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 in our world of, of marketing, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's in our face all the time, the right. things of the world. Well, and some of them are not really in our face either. Some of them are so subtle that it's yeah. so easy to slip nowadays. You know, what what radio station do you listen to? I love country music. I, I really do. I love country music. And occasionally I'll flip over to the country music station because I love the, the – today's country is not country. Let me go ahead and put that out there. <laughs> 
but I love the old country. But every once in a while, some of these songs that aren't edifying, I'm, I'm saying that some country music is. Maybe that's <laughs> – anyway, some of the songs come on that, that really don't have a message that I know you'd be listening to, but the station's on, and that – it's amazing yeah. how if you're, even if you're not listening to the work, that stuff is absorbed. You know, what TV shows yeah. are you watching? Yeah. Um, I, I really do try. Holly and I have stopped watching several shows through the years that were just great shows, and they have to throw this one thing in there. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever. It's like there's there's an agenda for a lot of them, but if you keep watching it, that stuff will just slowly, you know, creep in. What f- friend group are you hanging out with? Yeah. Um, are you the influencer? Or are you being influenced? And just those three things alone can completely change the trajectory of your day. Yep. You can either be doing things, listening to things, watching things, hanging out with people who are building you up. Or you can be watching things, listening things, hanging out with people who are bringing you down. Yep. And it's a cumulative effect, too. Yeah. Um, and so you've got to be – you use the word intentional. Yeah. In those areas, we have to be intentional. Yep. There's so so many things out there. Social media is another one. You sure. Know, if you're subscribed or, or not – or apps, apps on your phone. Mm-hmm. There's certain things that you can you can go, you know what, this isn't, this isn't good. I, I need to get rid of this thing. You know, there's a lot of things out there. And if, you're, if your walk way. is where it needs to be, God will prompt you. Yeah. I mean, he will wear you out on some of these <laughs> yeah. things. Um, and we got to listen. Yep, yep. Last question. Are you using your passions to glorify him? Uh, of course, this one's kind of easy for us because this is kind of what Run for God is about. Mm-hmm. It's about using our passions. But even then, if you go back to that, that last point, we still have to be intentional about yeah. what we're doing because it's really easy to just go through the motions isn't it sure it's easy to say okay we're going to do this we're going to it come, becomes formulaic at some point in time um it's a lot like we've all bowed our heads to pray and you realized realized in the middle of the prayer all i did was just say the same thing i've said a million times before and, and sometimes it's okay but but my heart is i'm just going through the motions mm-hmm. and we've got to be careful about that even when we're doing what God wants us to do, you have to be careful about that, don't you? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, and here's something to think think about too for for those who have a different train of thought. You may think that your passion, whatever your passion is, can't be used for God. I've heard that a lot. People mm-hmm. that they're like, well, you know, this is my thing, and that's not really a God thing. Well, I'm thinking about a guy who lives right down the road from me who is a huge train enthusiast. Mm-hmm. Now, when I say train enthusiast, <laughs> yes. I mean, you can't get any more enthusiastic than building a house right between two railroad tracks, which is what he did. Right. Um, he loves it. He goes out there every day. And, and it's fo- not like they're a mile from his house on either side. No. They're like 100 yards. Like he could throw side. a rock and hit, <laughs> yeah. hit both train tracks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. his house has to vibrate when it has out. to. Yeah, it absolutely has to. I don't know if he did some special things to that house when he built it, or yeah, maybe part of the experience. <laughs> maybe so, maybe so. But he's out there with his camera as the trains ride by. The people, the the conductors stop and say hello to him because they know who he is. Um, so anyway, it's 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 pretty cool. But I think about it. Trains. Can I use trains? Mm-hmm. Why, sure he can. You think there aren't other train enthusiasts out there who don't love God too? Mm-hmm. and or, or train enthusiasts who need to hear about God? Right. Absolutely. So even something like that, that, that's about as far out there as just comes off the top of my head that I can think of that is something I can hear somebody going, I couldn't use that. Sure you could. Whatever we do. That's right. Do it for the glory of God. So Second Corinthians ten thirty one. Yeah, right? and yeah. whether that's trains or that's running or that's crochet or whatever, that yeah. this is where the heart of ministry is. Ministry is doing what you love and doing it for the glory of God, and it's infectious. People see it and they want to know what you've got. And yes, that may be 
training for a 5K. But guess what's in chapter 9 and 10 of that training for that 5K? The gospel. That's right. And we can weave that into the tapestry of our lives. You know, it's not something that we have to ram in people's face. But when it comes across as that's who we are, that's when it's really appealing to people. And that's Amen. where that's where Christ shines the brightest. Amen. While you're working hard to keep your body in shape physically, the music you listen to while you run can help keep you in shape spiritually. We've partnered with J Radio to put together a group of running playlists by Dean, Lane, Holly, myself, and others that you hear here on the Run For God podcast. Plus, you can listen to a playlist put together by members of Run Club just like you. Check out the whole station of Run For God playlist at jradio.com and in the J Radio app. All right, so we're back. I just took that from you. Didn't yeah, I? you did. Wow, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you did a thing this past weekend. Yeah, something new I'd never tried before. Even when I was young, I never tried to run four races in four days. And so, they actually were the four longest races in a standard track meet. So, really? I never really thought about that until afterwards. So, somebody I was talking with somebody who had run. They had run several races, but they had run much shorter races. And uh, they're like, I, yeah, I, I'll run all these other ones, and I ain't running this. I, so I'm just going to be very honest with you about what I was thinking. Yeah. When you were telling me that you were going up there and what you were doing and the races you were running, there's one race that stood out to me. Yeah. And it's one that you have to jump over things. Yeah. And you don't have a good history of jumping <laughs> over things. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I jumped over a fence at one time, and I still have no idea how it happened to this day, but I somehow just landed directly on my side and i dislocated like six or seven ribs and it was extremely painful that's the one and only time i've ever ran with you in the days after that where i was faster than you yeah you were struggling and hurting <laughs> it hurt. so you told me you were doing the steeplechase which includes hurdles and barriers and 35 barriers uh seven of those in a water jump where you jump over a barrier and there's water a water pit on the other side of it um, and and so did you have a long history of doing hurdles? I've never jumped. I, I hadn't jumped over a hurdle, I don't think, until the week before. So I jumped over a couple of hurdles just to see and how that was And you told me the feel. story about the week before. You got to thinking, oh, I yeah. guess I need to practice that. Yeah, yeah. So I did. And uh, and I was glad I did because I, I, the first time I approached the hurdle, I was like, whoa, this is a little scarier than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Because the barriers are 36 inches high, so they're... Did I mean, you have flashbacks of chain link fences and dislocated I, ribs? I and, didn't. I had every confidence I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and I got in the race, and I'll tell you that this is funny. Funny story. I got a, I got in the race, and the one that worried me was the water jump, because I couldn't... Pra- I'd never practiced the water jump. So the first time I was ever going to do the water jump was going to be in the race. And so I hit that water jump the first time. And, you know, on the water jump, you, you kind of put your foot on the top of the barrier and you push off and, and land out into the water. And um, I executed it flawlessly the first time. I mean, it was perfect. I was like, I got this. <laughs> and then the second that lap came. That hubris creeped in. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> the second lap came around, and I nearly face planted in that Is water. Is that the one where Debbie caught the picture? It looks, it looks like you're about to face plant. No, I think that was one a little bit later. Okay. But yeah, no. That yeah, it was it it was it was scary. I really thought I was going down. So, you ran day I, 1 was the 5k. That's right. And you got I was third. Third. Right. Day 2 was the steeplechase steeple and you're now the national champion. Yep, in the steeplechase. In the steeplechase and you had never done it. You had never jumped hurdles to the week before and i'm gonna go back and do that one again that well, was you fun. have to now that was fun yeah day three was 10k 10k and you got second yeah and then day four was 1500 meters 1500 meters which was the hardest i struggled really bad in the 10k mm-hmm. i struggled mightily over the last two miles of the 10k i had a uh it's like my left leg wouldn't work it's like it wouldn't support my weight and the last two miles were 
were absolutely miserable. I mean, they were really, really bad. As a matter of fact, they were so bad that I almost didn't run the 1500 the next day. And you got what in the 1500? I didn't ask Second. That. Second. Second. So you got a third, two seconds, and a national championship. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's a. Uh, it was. I hope when do. I grow up, I'm like you, Dean. <laughs> it was fun to do, but I'll tell you this: yesterday, I got I was running with the cross country team, and one you, you know Patton, mm -hmm. he comes running by us, and he's running fast, and um, I told him as he came by, I said, I said, Patton, I said, if you're going to run faster than me in practice, you better run faster than me in a race too. Oh, I'm sure he had a good comeback. For oh that. yeah, yeah. He said I will, <laughs> and he kept running. And so I like ah, so I ran up there to run with him, and we just hammered that loop over there. Hey, when Neil. I hear my youngest had a pretty good run yesterday, he was right behind us as as we passed the first mile. He he goes uh, he goes hey, I think I just broke. I just set he my just PR, PR for the mile. He, was it like six fifteen? Something like 607, that. Six oh seven. Yeah. Well, he told that. He said that last night, and Lane was like, I don't think Lane believed him. Well, I don't think it was accurate. Really? Yes. Okay. Because my watch said it was like 7.30 or something like that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. To run a 6.15 mile on where we were running would have been Well, that's what Lane was saying. He's really like, I just amazing. can't believe that. Yeah. I just don't believe that. But I was having a ball just watching Lane's mind get blown. Yeah. So. It was awesome. He but, may listen to this and hear that, but I'm not going to tell him that. But I'm going to tell you, we were pressing pretty good, and he was right there, and he was talking while while he was there. I was very impressed. I was very impressed with. Uh, it's uh, it's funny how two different kids from the same house can be so different because Lane, you can push, 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 and he'll get faster, faster, faster. Landon, when you take your hands completely off, that's when he'll get faster. Yeah, you know. It, <laughs> So we're running, right? And we're and we're we're moving pretty good to start with. And Landon's running right behind me. And he says to me, he says, uh he says, So uh how did he put it? He it was something like should is it okay for me to run hard or something like that? Mm -hmm. Um or should we be running easy? How should we be running this? And I said, Well, I said, you know what the Kenyans do? They kind of run how they feel. And so he was like, All right, I think I feel pretty good today. Boom. He told me you said that, yeah. He, he took off, yeah. I was really proud of him. I was really yeah, proud well, of him. I'm just going to let Lane keep thinking that he ran a 607 first mile. At Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, Landon said he broke his 5K, two mile, and one mile yep. records all in the same run yesterday. Yep. Of course, he's put the time in this year. I, I'm, he's been working hard. I'm excited to see what he might do. He's got you know? some. He's got a competitive. Of course, I tear him. Lane. I get Lane so tore up. I said, "You know your brother's going because Lane broke all the records at high school." Yeah. And I said, "You know your brother's going to break all your." No way. There's no way. He's not going to do that. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. It is time for Dean's thoughts, and that's a time when I share something that I've written about the intersection between running and faith. Do expectations have an impact on performance? Well, I think so. Let me explain in this story called Expecting the Worst. I remember vividly a tongue-in-cheek presentation that posited that we should expect the worst thing possible to happen when we face difficulty. That way, if the worst does happen, then we're happy because that means we were right. And we all love to be right. But if something better happens compared to our expectations, then we're happy because we overshot expectations. And who doesn't like to do better than we expect? <laughs> Funny? Maybe. The problem is that many people, whether they admit it or not, actually live this way. And there are certainly negative implications to that way of thinking. Let's look at how we can avoid that kind of thinking. This weekend, I decided to try something new that I thought would probably break me. I did it on purpose, knowing there was, in all likelihood, a crash coming. I ran four races in four days. Now, when I was young, this would have hurt, but I would have been able to handle it without question. But I'm not so young anymore, and a 55-year-old body doesn't recover like a 25-year-old body. So how did I stay positive each day? One thing that interested me was to see just how much I could force my body to recover from day to day. I used all the recovery tactics I could think of to see how well they worked. For the most part, I was happy with how much I felt I could delay the fatigue in my legs, but I knew it was coming. 
I wanted to stay positive, as positive as I could, about my prospects for each day, and I knew that recovering well would give me the best possible chance. I was expecting the best. I discovered some interesting things that I never knew, like the fact that Altoids, yes, the peppermints, (laughs) can help ease your stomach just before a race when it doesn't feel good. I found a new Epsom salt that seems to be a game changer, too. Now, I know what you're thinking. Coach, I thought we should never try new things on race day. And that is true. But I didn't know if I didn't know if I would ever come down this road again. So I was throwing the kitchen sink at it. In addition, while I thought some of those things might not help, I didn't think it would hurt. I was expecting the best. And I met some great people. The guy who won the 5K and 10K beating me twice was an Irishman with a physically challenged daughter who is in college in Ireland even as we were competing. I met some amazingly inspirational athletes. Have you ever met a 96-year-old sprinter? I have. And I made some connections to runners who wanted to know more about Run for God. I met some of the best people, and I fed off their energy to help build my confidence and enable myself to expect the best. Ultimately, I fell apart about 18 or 14 laps into the 10K on day three. It hurt pretty bad. Would I change anything? No. It was instructive for both my future and those I coach. I'm thankful for the trials, and I expected to be able to bring out my best the next day regardless. Back to the expect the worst attitude. My first day was not very good. I could have assumed that each successive day would be a little worse. After all, that's what expect the 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 worst crowd would have thought. But I chose to hang my hat on anything positive I could draw from that first day. I refused to believe that I would continue to have rough days just because it started that way. The result was my best race of the weekend on the second day. I honestly believe that my positive outlook contributed to a great day. And then, after the painful lesson of the 10K, I wondered if I should just call it a meet. But I just focused on staying positive and seeing what was in the body the next day. On day four, I warmed up for the 1,500 meters. It's a short race, and the pain is intense. I was looking forward to seeing how hard I could push a tired body. The race started slow, and I immediately thought this would be to my advantage. I was right behind the two leaders after the first lap. The slower pace allowed me to stay in the race. The second lap was more of the same, uh, more of the same pace, even though it was a slow pace. It was getting harder to keep up, uh, excuse me, but even though it was a slow pace, it was getting harder to keep close to the leaders. On the third lap, a new friend of mine from Springfield, Massachusetts, came around me as I was losing contact with the leaders. My metal chances were running away from me. As the gap widened to more than 10 meters, my thought was this. You have no idea what's going to happen up there. You don't know how they feel or how hard they're running. I just wanted to stay as close as I could and be ready if anyone faltered in the slightest. I was expecting the best, at least for me. As we went into the last lap, my new friend began to falter. I decided it was now or never, and I launched my attack. I passed him just before the 300 meter uh, to 300 meter to go mark and focused on the two guys who were about 20 meters ahead. As the eventual winner started his kick with 200 meters to go, the former leader had nothing left with which to respond. When I hit 200 meters, I went all in and started my sprint for the finish line. I ran past him with about 140 meters left, but the leader was too far away. I focused on trying to keep my position as I knew there were guys just behind me, and now I was the guy being hunted. I gave it all I could until the finish line finally arrived. I had finished second way better than I thought I would do. Turns out, my optimism had paid off. But I can't help but think about how the race would have unfolded if I had expected the worst. I don't believe I would have finished in the top three. In the end, there were four guys within 20 to 30 meters of me at the line. The entire weekend was filled with pep talks trying to coax my tired body into getting ready for the next challenge. I had kept the vision of hope in front of me, the hope for a good experience even though my body was telling me I should give up. Always remember that we have the ultimate hope in Jesus Christ. But just like my body kept trying to tell me there was no hope for the next day, there was reason to believe that the next day could be better. Doesn't the crash of the 10K seem a lot like those low points in life? We've all been through those times when it was tough just to get to the finish line. 
sometimes it's really hard to bounce back from those times. But my experience with running has been that every running day is its own day. Just because I feel bad one day doesn't mean I have to feel bad the next. Another thing I know is that God shows up when we need him most. We have every reason to believe and hope for tomorrow because we've seen what God can do. Just like my running experience allows me to think positively no matter the situation, my experiences with God allow me to always believe he is going to work things out for my good. If you're a child of the king, there is no reason to ever expect the worst, not just because it's not the right thing to do, but because we have the experience that tells us that every day holds hope. And ultimately, we know the end of the story. If I had if I had known the outcome of my race before I ran it, I would it would have been easy to have had hope. In the race of life, we win. We have every reason to have the ultimate hope. That's a great story, Dean. <laughs> You know, I, I presented this whole idea of this. this I, I told the high school team, I said, I know what you guys are thinking before a race. Mm-hmm. You're thinking, this is going to be a bad day. Mm-hmm. And then you know that in the end, if you have a bad day, then you're happy because you had a bad day. And if you have a better day, then you're happy because you had a better day than you thought you would, even though it might not have been the day you really wanted to have. And I said, I know you think that. Who in here has thought that? And you know what? Almost every one of them raised their hand. Mm-hmm. And I was really surprised that they were honest about that. Because I really thought someone would go, oh, I don't ever do that. I try, I, I try to always give it my best every day. Right. But they, re- they admitted that. Uh, and I, I thought that was interesting. Well, you hear it a lot at races. Not, not so much in, – in, well, even in, the, even in the circles I run in, which is the slower packs – but even in the fast groups, you, you hear the fast guys talking before a race, and you'll hear things like, oh, I had a long training run yesterday, or yeah. you know, my mileage hasn't been what I wanted it to be. It's, it's always, it seems like it's always the negative setting themselves up for failure so that if they do fail, they've already given, they've already given the reason beforehand so they can point to that. See, I told you I had a, you know, I had yeah. a bad training week last week. Um, and then and that's that's destructive. Yeah, and then there are the guys like the Irishman that I met, super super nice guy. Michael Collins, his name is. He um, he came in the day of the ten k. I walked into the stadium with him. He was limping, and he had a, a bandage around his calf. Hmm. Didn't he didn't say a word about it? He was literally limping, and I said, I said, you, is your calf okay? And and he's like, yeah, it's just a it's, it's just a little little thing no big deal and he went out there and drilled me on the track <laughs> so uh yeah that's the kind of guy you like to see yeah the kind of guy who just, you know no excuses yeah no yeah. Uh, no if i have a bad race it ain't gonna be because of this right <laughs> yeah 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 it's it's good uh yeah i think people are afraid that it's more of a letdown if they expect really big things to happen and then they don't happen then it would be to think the other way uh, I, I don't know. I've done it myself. I've gone into races going, um, I, I know I'm not in the best shape. I know. I was really purposeful about this past weekend about trying not to do that because mm-hmm. I knew even the second day my body was going to start revolting. Um, and I knew that the only way that I could do anything was to not let myself go there. But I think that that's the problem is that we're, we're just worried. We, we think it's failure. If we think we're, if we hope we're going to do something great and then we don't, we think we failed. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we failed. You know, if we're trying to run a sub three hour marathon mm-hmm. and we we go out there and we give it our absolute best and maybe we're in shape to do it, but maybe we fall a little bit short. We run three oh five. Did we fail? Mm-mm. No, no, because we put that effort in and we tried it. We gave it our best shot and we gave ourselves every opportunity to do it. Then we should be able to hold our head high and be happy about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A lot happier than if you thought, you know what, my, my, my leg's been hurting, and I know I could probably run three hours, but I'm going to shoot for 315, and then run 310, and then go, yeah, see, I did better than I thought I would do. You know, I just, the, the two. Some people have goals, and they have alternate goals. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the bottom line, I think, is that great things don't happen from negative thinking. They just don't. You get... You have the opportunity to do okay with negative thinking. You don't have the opportunity to do great with negative thinking. 
yeah i mean i've i've always been a big proponent that you know i've i've never allowed my kids to give excuses you're right even yeah. though even though the excuses may be legitimate it never helps to vocalize that mm-hmm. so you know we coached a lot of athletes and and they they always come in and it's i mean you you especially at cross country races these you hear the kids come in and they're like giving all these reasons and i've always said don't do that yep go up to your competitor and say i got beat great job and leave it at that because when you give excuses you're taking away the the you're taking away something from the guy that beat you which is not fair he beat you Mm -hmm. period Mm -hmm. and you're not helping yourself for the next time because if you if you have this well my stomach was hurting that's why that's why i got beat well you you should not vocalize the part that my stomach was hurting you should vocalize that i got beat and doggone it that won't happen again and then do something about your stomach. But when you vocalize, I, I've, I've always said that when you vocalize things, you make it so. Yeah. And you'll use that the next time. Well, not only that, but oftentimes what I have found is it's competitors talking to each other a lot of times when yeah. somebody does that. And now you've given confidence to the other person as well. Right. So anytime anybody's whining and complaining before a race, I'm like, keep it up. Yeah. Keep it up. <laughs> you know? And then it just doesn't come off good after the race yeah when you do that it just it it's never a good thing to vocalize your excuses you may have a legitimate reason that you didn't do whatever that you didn't get that promotion that you didn't win that race that you didn't whatever it is internalize that yeah don't vocalize it and then shoot to do better well we saw something in that track meet actually the the group actually it was the race just before ours Mm -hmm. in the 1500 meters they shot the gun off. They went. They they took off. They ran seven hundred meters, and then the race officials stopped them after seven hundred meters. That's almost two laps. That's a substantial portion of the race. What happened was the timing system didn't start. This was in what kind of race again? This is in a national championship. But I 1500 mean, fifteen hundred meters. meters. Okay. Yeah. This was the sixty to sixty. They ran half the race. Or, yeah. They ran half the race. And um, but but here's the thing. And this, because this is where a lot of excuses come in, is well, you know, they they blew it with this race. Well, guess what? Everybody ran seven hundred meters. Mm-hmm. Everybody. I heard one guy who I know, who was very vocal about what was going on. They had I probably know the one you're thinking. They had about. they had stopped him, and he was just. I mean, he said, "This is." He said, "You should have just let us keep going." And he just was just. I mean, just really, really Brilliant. on the officials, just brutal, and. And I thought, you know, the officials are in a tough spot. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, could they have let them keep going and just counted their places? They could have. They could have done that. They could have done their best to, to maybe ballpark their times even or something but like that. But then they got drilled for not having times. Exactly. <laughs> so they're, they're in a no-win situation. Right. And I and I, was, I had a lot of respect for the, the guy who I guess was in charge of, of getting people on and off the track and stuff. He came over to him. He sat them all down. He said, first of all, I want to apologize. You guys should not have to run this thing again. He said, but we, at this point, we, that's what we're going to do because we don't have any other choice. But I need everybody here to agree with that. It was, it, was, it was handled very well. And then I went to that same guy who was whining about it, and I pointed out to him that he is not a 1,500-meter runner. He is a 10K type of guy and he's much better at the longer distances and i said don't you realize you just got an advantage yeah and he and then he turned looked, his 1500 into a 2200 meter race yeah so he looks up at me and he goes yeah i kind of thought about that afterwards <laughs> <laughs> think think before we get worked up <laughs> <laughs> If you've ever participated in any sport, you've probably met a great coach. Great coaches inspire us to do more than we ever thought possible. You can be the leader that helps others achieve things they never thought possible. You. Yes, you have the ability and the opportunity to be that person. All you need is a heart to help people and the ability to follow a plan. The Run for God 5K Challenge will come ready to help you inspire those around you. 
The step-by-step guide will direct you how to plan, pray, and train people both physically and spiritually. You can help them become more fit in their health and in their walk with Christ. Share your passion. Go to runforgod.com to find out how to inspire others to accomplish big things. All right, we're back. And let me ask you this question. Are there any sports that you think should not be in the Olympics? Because I don't think rhythmic gymnastics and synchronized swimming should be in the Olympics. Now, let me say this. If you like those sports, look, I get it. I get, and I'm not saying that those people don't aren't. I mean, they're, they're athletes. I'm not saying they're not athletes. I'm just saying... I just don't like the idea of those. They don't make sense to me in the Olympics. There's They're some not sports that I wonder how that they've caught so much traction. And yeah, <laughs> I flip. I was flipping through channels the other night on TV, and I got ESPN, and they were showing the World Championship cornhole board. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a big thing now. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> they won't show the World Championship triathlon on ESPN, but they'll show the World Championship cornhole board yeah how does that even happen how did how did it i mean i love cornhole board as much as the next guy but to rise to the level of being on espn and and even having a world championship it's all it's all about money and the amount of money that it costs for espn to televise cornhole was probably far less than what it would have cost them to televise triathlon yeah, if you I think guess. about it, that's, it's all about the dollars and cents, and can they pay enough for the rights to get their money back? Yeah, I mean they had sponsors, and I mean they oh, were yeah. decked out and jerseys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Johnsonville um, sausage, I guess it is. I think the, the boards even had that on. Had it? I mean they're it. They're like NASCAR drivers, aren't they? Well, I mean, think about what's usually going on when people are playing cornhole. They're eating bratwurst and drinking (laughs) beer. Yeah, it makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, so I was just amazed (laughs) and I flipped it on the TV and it's like the world championship. And they're so focused and I know what I'm doing. Trying to get the twist and. I'm 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 starting a petition. If you want to sign my petition, now maybe I'll put it online. We're going to get cornhole in the next Olympics. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, well, and then there's there's <clears throat> there's sports that aren't included. Um, do you, you know rugby's not in the Olympics? It was at one time years ago, but I would think rugby is a pretty popular sport worldwide. It's not necessarily in the United States, but it is worldwide. I would think rugby would be a sport. Well, they just not. put was it baseball and softball back in? Yeah, this yeah. time around. I mean, how did how did that get taken out? I mean, those are humongous sports. Yeah, I don't know. I, um, I, I, don't, I don't understand. I mean, I don't I don't mind anything being in the Olympics. I think the more the merrier. But why are you taking some of these big sports out? Yeah, um, it's, it is strange. You know, why was it two the year two thousand before? triathlon got put in well now triathlon didn't even start until the 70s well but still i mean it's a it's an endurance sport you know i i said the other day they need to have two triathlons they need to have the olympic and they need to have the ironman distance yeah completely different group of people well unless you're christian blumenfeld yeah (laughs) um yeah that that would be it would be cool yeah that would be cool yeah, I, I saw a list of sports that should be included in the Olympics, and um, a couple. Here's a couple of them. How about foosball? <laughs> so that is what you meant to put there. I saw that, and I thought he meant to put football, <laughs> but you meant to say foosball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, foosball or dodgeball. Should we have dodgeball in the Olympics? See, that would that is a great sport. That I love fun. dodgeball. <laughs> Uh, UFC fighting is really big these days. I don't know how big it is outside the United States, but I know there's a lot of guys from outside the United States that participate in it. Yeah. So UFC fighting is really big. It wouldn't surprise me to see that. Boxing has become so much less popular. Mm -hmm. A lot more people are watching UFC fighting these days than boxing. But Mm -hmm. boxing is still in the Olympics. So I don't know. Interesting. So do you like regular volleyball or beach volleyball better? I don't watch either you like one either of them. One. No. Neither one. Neither one. Yeah, I just heard an argument this morning, and it was it was a good one. There was apparently, I think it was Americans, the women wanted to wear 
regular athletic shorts, and they won't let them. Really? They make them wear these these skimpy outfits, and I think that is sending the wrong message. That is just – I don't understand. Really? To not allow them when they asked for it. Now, to, to have that be part of the standard uniform, whatever, whatever, that's, that's a whole different – Category. But when somebody says we want to do this instead, I don't understand. Right? You know, so hmm. well, that that's beach volleyball, of course. Um, but I like I, beach volleyball. To me, they said I, I heard a stat. They said that you have to work one point six times harder playing volleyball in the sand than you do playing on a volleyball oh, court. Sure. And uh, have you ever, you ever played, tried to run on the sand? Yeah, I played soccer in the sand. Let me tell you something. You want to work out? Yeah. Play soccer in the sand. Yeah, I could. I can't imagine. That is tough. You can play for about fifteen minutes and you're done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, we have a trivia question for this week. Our trivia question is this: What country has won more gold medals in the Summer Olympics than any other country? And what sport has produced the most medals for that country? Do you know? To this me, one? to me, it's obvious, but I, I don't. I could be very wrong. Really? Yeah. I think it's obvious. All right. So your expression makes me think I'm wrong. Well, you know, you have missed some of these before. <laughs> I have. I've so. missed a lot of them. <laughs> so you can send those answers to dean at runforgod.com. The first one to send a message to me at dean at runforgod.com. With your T-shirt size. With your T-shirt size and your address. Mm-hmm. Um, we will send you a Run Club box. So send those answers. All right. Every week. We share a reason why running is so awesome. And, you know, I've done this now. This is our 72nd episode. I don't know which ones I've – maybe I've repeated some and maybe I haven't. I don't know. I try to come up with something new every time. But this one is camaraderie. The definition of camaraderie is this. Mutual trust and friendship among people who spend a lot of time together. Hmm. That sounds like running, doesn't yeah. it? It really does. Um, and there's something about suffering together. <laughs> That, that makes those bonds much tighter, you know, when we're when when we we all kind of go to battle together. Yeah, you know. And I always said, I remember when I was in high school, people would ask me, "What which do you like better, track or cross country?" And this was always my answer: I love the camaraderie of cross country, but I love the competition of track. And I still feel that way today. I love the team atmosphere of cross country. That's right. what I really enjoy the most. But I love the pure competitiveness of the track there is all the variables out uh, there's nothing like that feeling this past week of being in fourth place going to that last lap on that 1500 and then passing a couple of people ain't there's nothing in cross country to compare to that in my opinion Hmm. so but i love cross country because it's just such a cool team sport anyway i think that people's personalities fall into one or the other People either they love the camaraderie so much more, so they they love cross country more, or they're just pure competition people and they love track. See, as a spectator, it's no question. That's because there's only one cross country race. Track meets are the worst. (laughs) Track meets and swim meets. As a spectator, there's just not much worse. (laughs) That's because you you need to go to a college meet. I think you'd like it better because it moves still hours though. Yeah, well, it's true. All right, our motivational thought of the week comes from Kristen Armstrong, who is an author from, of the book Mile Markers, and she's written several books. Anyway, this is her quote. There is something magical about running. After a certain distance, it transcends the body. Then a bit further, it transcends the mind. A bit further yet, and what you have before you laid bare is the soul. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Um, and I, you know, I prefer to look that kind of spiritually, right? Um, and I think there is there's some truth to that. That running can absolutely bring you closer to God. Uh, for this very reason, for what, sure. what she's saying is, I, I think you just get to that that raw. This is hard, and you you just you you just get to that point where you just don't have any choice but to look God in the eye when when you're running. All right. We're doing great, right? Yeah. All right. So for all of you out there, I'm going to keep the challenge out there. Be thinking about, start praying about the idea of facilitating a Run for God Couch to Marathon challenge in your community this 
January. Amen. And keep glorifying God in running and all that you do. May God bless every step of every run. Go out there and shine your light. Good job, Dean. And congratulations on the National Championship. For more information about the Run for God ministry, go to runforgod.com. If you have questions about your salvation, click on the Peace with God tab. There's nothing more important. Thanks for joining us today.